Welcome to this new thinking for a new world podcast of the Talberg Foundation. The COVID economy, your bust, my boom. Like everything in life, COVID is producing losers and winners, not the least from the tsunami-like global recession it has spawned. It's even possible that the pernicious economic effects will linger long after the pandemic has faded and that the winners will still be winners. What happens when the global economy collapses, but global financial markets boom? Alan Stoga explores these and other questions with German business leader Kurt Lauk and longtime top American central banker Terence Checky. We live in extraordinary economic times. The IMF has recently decided, I have no idea how they did this, that this is the most global and deepest recession since at least 1870. The responses have been equally extraordinary. Governments around the world have announced at least $11 trillion of fiscal stimulus so far this year, and that number is still rising. Central banks in the G10, the 10 largest economies, have increased the size of their balance sheets so far this year by at least $6 trillion, and the money spigots are still wide open. You both have long experience as practitioners in the global economy. You, Terry, as a central banker, you, Kurt, as a global business leader, what do you think are likely to be the most important consequences of all that spending and all that money creation now and far more importantly in the future? Terry, you want to take a first crack? The money creation and spending was designed to buy time. It was designed to buy time to heal the economy. And the question is whether or not we have made good use of that time. Um, there are those who would say that um, we have bought time, but haven't necessarily uh, done the structural adjustments that would allow the economy to continue to uh, be productive and to function on its own. My own bias in this um, discussion is that we have been using cyclical medicine to treat structural illness. And we have administered larger and larger doses to produce smaller and smaller effects. And um, I'm not quite sure where we are at the moment in terms of actually grappling with the underlying structural issues that need to be addressed in the economy. We've certainly provided the liquidity. The question is, have we followed through with the therapeutics that are necessary to produce a healthy economy? So, Kurt, that's exactly the question to you. Have we followed through with the therapeutics? Are we doing the things to heal the patient, or are we just administering bigger and bigger doses of morphine? You know, in, in Europe, the philosophy has been to install a growth pact, stability and growth pact. And um, the idea behind it was that if you spend money to stabilize an economy or to advance economy, it is contingent upon structural reforms. And what we have seen in the last uh, basically 10 years that the ECB has continued to spend money, but the structural reforms are deficient but not in all of European countries. Ireland has made structural reforms. Some uh, Danish people, Netherlands, the Greek have done a phenomenal uh, thing, the, even the Austrians and the Germans. The ones who have not done structural reforms, but still need uh, the money, uh, is um, Italy, the southern belt of Europe, basically. France, Italy, Spain. Portugal is different. In other words, Those countries who have not done structural reforms are now particularly heavily hit by the crisis, Um, and they need more money. And now the um, ECB and now the um, pandemic rescue package, which is under negotiations right now in these days, the um, southern countries basically ask for money without and, and refuse to have it tied to structural reforms. Now, the pandemic, of course, made it worse. The um, Southern European countries, 
um, have been hit harder because they were unprepared when it comes to healthcare hospitals and, and other necessary infrastructure issues. And now they want the money unconditional. And the EU Commission has basically given in. They have tabled a proposal, which is right now negotiated, 750 billion of help, support to come out of the pandemic without any strings attached. And now the parliament is trying to get involved and the um, four countries, Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, and Germany say, you have to do structural reforms, otherwise you, you won't get the money. Anyway, um, this is a situation where it becomes very difficult. That is issue number one. So the past failure to do structural reforms, as Terry mentioned, uh, is now becoming more obvious. Second, the state is now financing many businesses in when can debate whether it's needed and to what extent it's needed. But this comes with strings in all countries. The state influence in the economy is tied to the support of the economy. In other words, the state influence in economic activities has increased. And I don't believe that the state will give up this increased influence. That's a terrifically important point. And it's consistent with the larger point that both of you made, which is to say, this crisis, the current economic and financial crisis, really started in 2008, which means the shift, Kurt, as you've just said, to government as the driver of economic activity in powerful ways has been ongoing for at least a decade. Terry, how does that end? <laughs> if history is any guide, um, badly. The As I said earlier, all of these programs were designed to buy time, time to allow the economy to heal, time to help it heal. That means putting in place the mechanisms that will allow the economy to stand on its own and operate on its own. We have, in the process of doing what we've been doing to help sustain the economy and avoid uh, the kinds of difficulties that um, are, are very destructive, we've managed to run up massive amounts of debt. One of the reasons we got into the problems in, in 2008 was the failure to distinguish between the quantity of growth and the quality of growth. And we have an economy where uh, prior to 2008, something like 40% of the revenues in the economy were coming from the financial sector. Um, we've managed to take finance, which is designed to um, support the real economy. And in a, in a lot of ways, it's become a substitute for the real economy. We talk about inequality as though inequality in, in our system is the result of moral turpitude. Well, we can debate that, but I think it's a it's more of a reflection of what we've allowed to happen to the underlying structure of our economy. We've hollowed out the middle of the social structure. We've now got a, an economy that has um, tech and finance at the very top, and retail and healthcare at the very bottom, and the vast middle, which used to be the backbone of the United States, has pretty much disappeared. And I think that's what a lot of the statistics reflect. So you've got a very robust um, technocratic class and financial class and a very beaten down middle class um, and the, the lower income strata has, has really been trapped. Another way of putting that, I think, is that big chunks of the U.S. economy have not been growing for some time. That is certainly also the case in Europe. There's an argument around that we in Europe, in North America, are entering something like what happened to Japan decades ago. Japan, since 1980, has grown less than half a percent a year on average. Uh, and indeed, most of those years didn't grow at all. Kurt, have we forgotten how to grow? In Europe, 
Certainly. I agree with Terry, it will end badly. I would only add the following question. I don't know when. The politicians have a great way to kick the can down the road. And this crisis is significantly different from the crisis, financial crisis in uh, eight, nine. The recovery this time is much more difficult than it was in the, in the previous crisis 10 years ago. Um, and it will affect much wider segments of the economy. Therefore, I think the growth potential is much lower coming out of this crisis than in the last crisis. And there is one sector which is different, which is the technology sector. The technology sector uh, will continue to grow, even probably accelerated growth in some segments than any other industrial sector I can think of. Let's talk for a second about inflation. Every company I know has seen its cost curve shift upwards. And that's whether it's a barbershop, a grocery store, an automobile manufacturer, per unit of output, everything costs more to make today than it did literally six months ago. And there's an enormous amount of investment to keep, to reopen, to keep production of goods and services going. On the other hand, there is also an enormous amount of unused capacity. So companies are constrained in their ability to raise prices. Again, that can't end well. What happens? Terry? I wish I had a, a good answer for you on that. I think we have come through a very long period where labor costs have been pretty well squeezed. And I think, at least in the, in the short and intermediate term, that's over. So I think we're going to see continued pressures on wages. I think that um, the restructuring of supply chains, which is inevitable in the aftermath of what we're seeing, is going to lead to higher costs. I think that's going to pressure margins for businesses. You know, in the intermediate term, uh, uh, plus, I'm sorry, plus, if you look at what has continued to happen in terms of um, the printing of money, I think we're going to see um, inflation tending to drift upward as we get out in time. But I would argue that if you look at the components, if you look at energy, um, energy is likely to get more expensive going forward, not less. Uh, labor is going to be more expensive going forward, not less. The inputs that produce food and other consumables are likely to be uh, more costly rather than less. So I think we're going to see something that resembles a more traditional form of um, inflation. Kurt, same question. How do you look at inflation? Is it dead and buried or is it still alive and just hiding? I agree with the analysis of Terry uh, with one um, addition. Yes. Um, many uh, services and um, things will become more expensive, but the purchasing power of the people will go down. And um, that is a counter argument to inflation. It could lead to uh, actually to a deflation. I don't know the outcome. I think we are at a crossroad and I don't know where the money will come from, from those people. If you have increase in, in, in wages on the one hand, yes. Uh, but on the other hand, the housing sector will be become lower. The boom is over. We have great exams in Europe, in Berlin, in other cities. So there are many counter effects to inflation, which I very have great difficulties to measure that and to weigh that. On the one side is certainly what Terry said. On the other hand is the purchasing power and the deflation or development in the housing industry and the car industry and so on and so forth. So we face a world that could either have inflation or deflation, or maybe the monkey in the middle, stagflation. The fact that we can't guess which of those three are possible probably tells us that we're in uncharted territory. We've never been here before. Alan, we have never seen a situation where the the principal risks have emanated from policy, politics, and a, um, a massive 
health challenge. And the complexity of that in an environment where um, the economy was already being challenged by a buildup of pressures that have occurred over the past um, two decades or three decades. Uh, it's, it's put us in a situation where we're confronting a host of issues, all of which are linked together and everything is changing in relation to everything else. It's, it's one of the most complex environments certainly I've ever seen. Um, and I, quite frankly, you know, we've, we've intervened in so many different sectors in so many different ways that the normal incentive structures are not operating. Um, it's very hard to come up with the probabilities that will allow you to do sensible risk analysis. So the uncertainty levels, I think, are extraordinarily high. And I think that's why you get this situation that says, well, you know, if X happens, we could go down. If Y happens, it could go up. But I don't know that there's any way of quantifying that um, with any degree of accuracy at all. So in that kind of world, why would anyone anywhere build a new plant, invest in new equipment, build the sinews of an economy of the future? Uh, isn't the risk, or at least the uncertainty, so great as to freeze in place most new productive investment? Kurt, why is that too negative? Um, you have to differentiate um, by segments. A lot of uh, new factories will be built with new uh, technology. Uh, let's take the battery-operated uh, cars, the hydrogen-operated cars, which need new investments. If you go to the pharmaceutical company, huge investments in biogenetics, um, not very labor-intensive, but huge investments. The hit will be of the traditional industries, manufacturing in a traditional form. Uh, in some parts of the world, uh, not in India, not in Latin America, uh, but certainly in Europe, in some places um, in, in, in Asia. So um, I think the picture to me is very mixed, very mixed. And I don't know the equation, what is on the right side and what is the left side of the equation. All of that sounds like not very many jobs are going to be created. All of that sounds like very high tech, both production facilities and end results, but very low labor component. Is that fair? Yes, I think that is the uh, assessment I would agree with. The labor intensive stuff will decrease, except in the people care, um, health care, uh, elderly care uh, people there, the employment will go up and has to go up. Alan, you and I have talked about this in the past. Um, for most of our lifetime, technology has been a net welfare-enhancing, job-creating good. You've had dislocations, but it's been an impetus for growth. Um, there's a real question as to whether or not we've reached a tipping point where technology is going to be more job-destructive than job-creative. Uh, the jobs will certainly be higher-end jobs. Um, but far fewer in number. And it's a continuation, I think, of what we've seen in this country. Um, and I think in that environment, you've got to ask yourself, um, what will motivate productive investment by the private sector? And if you look, um, you know, investment capital goes where it's welcome, where the rules of the game are clear and defined, where it can earn a reasonable return. Etc. And you've got to ask if those conditions exist. Let me segue from that to financial markets. As we've discussed, economies are hurting, people are hurting. In the short run, financial markets, however, are booming. Is this the latest manifestation of what Alan Greenspan used to call irrational exuberance? Or is it primarily the reflection of the extraordinary central bank? support of markets that is part and parcel of this response, as it was in 2008-10, to the crisis? You know, there's, there's very little mystery here. 
we we decoupled finance from the real economy um, a long time ago, and we have continued to nurture the growth of finance, as I said earlier. And markets, there are a lot of things markets don't do well, but the one thing they do very well is to learn. And they are directly linked now. You have markets that are no longer focused on economic fundamentals. They are focused on the activities of central bankers. And as long as the central bankers are in the mode they're in and providing the kind of um, stimulus and support um, for financial intermediation, I think you've got a problem in reestablishing the connection between the real economies and finance, reorienting it, re- re-right-sizing it is an enormous challenge going forward. Kurt, if this were 100 years ago or 200 years ago, we'd be worried about devaluation of currency, whether it be the dollar or the euro, because of what Terry just described, because of the massive issuance of currency, because of the explosion of central bank balance sheets. As you sit in Europe and travel the world, how can you imagine a world where the dollar is no longer the principal currency of this global economy? Um, I think a number of countries um, would like to replace the dollar as the world reserve currency. China is working on it. Russia is working on it. So, But it's uh, given the amount of dollars and the strength of the dollar uh, in the international economy as a tool to exchange goods, it will take a long time. It's not imminent. Um, and uh, the other issue is, which worries me most in this respect, um, uh, we are probably running into a society which, on the one hand, is very well to do for people with good education, and those who have not a good education, the labor which were needed to run a factory, uh, to sweep it out, or for example, um, they will be lost in the new in the new world, and this is worrying me most. Then the government has to come in and finance those people. Uh, so we have a totally new situation um, in a divided society. In all of the Western industrial societies, we run into a divided society. Those who are smart enough to play on the stock market, fine, they they can live. Um, those who are decided, um, educated to play in the digital economy, fine. Um, and, and those who were the um, hardworking laborers for uh, distribution and um, simple workers, they will get lost in the system. And this is undermining democracy. We have seen that in, in many cases in Europe. Now, those people who are basically outplaced or are thinking they will be outplaced in the new world, vote right or left, which makes democracies less stable. The bottom line, perhaps, is that on the one hand, as you've just said, Kurt, the political system, democracy in the West is less stable. And on the other hand, the economy, the economies are underperforming. What should we do to change that? Impossible question. So I'll give it to Terry first. Um, We need to get back to basics. Kurt used the word or the words good education. I'd say real education. We need investment in education that produces people who are capable of contributing to society, not who people who have degrees, but people who have the actual learning that will enable them to be productive members of society. So I think we've got to get back to focusing on training, education. I think um, government has um, not provided the the outcomes that are necessary for sustaining democracy. I, you know, we have plenty of government leaders who are well-intended, uh, but they want to be evaluated on the basis of their intentions, not on what they've produced. And I think that 
uh, as you can tell from everything that's going on around us, the tolerance of the electorate for um, for that is is over. So we need to get back to government pro providing the outcomes and the basics. We need policies that will support the population and enable them to um, recognize their potential. So I would invest in education. I would invest in training. We've got to start shoring up things like education and training and I think we've got to come up with a more rational system for delivering basic medical services. And we've got to, we've got to start doing the heavy lifting on the, the structural elements of our economy. And that's going to be a long-term process. And the we in that case, you're referring to the United States. Uh, Kurt, as you look at Europe and from Europe, what are the couple of things that in a perfect world you would want to happen to get to a better place than we seem to be headed at the moment? I would um, make three points. Clearly education of all levels of society and permanently throughout the life. And we need different institutions to take care of that or additional institutions. The one we have are pretty good, but we need additional institutions for permanent learning lifelong. Second, we have to find a way to compensate people who take care of other people who cannot take care of themselves anymore. That is a critical element for aging society, for uh, societies with high unemployment. We have to find a system where we can compensate people who take care of other people's and don't have an, any other job but taking care of other people. And thirdly, as uh, optimist as I am, I think we have to innovate out of this mess. There are enough fields to, for innovation. Um, one key element is uh, we need to have data collections and allow the data to flow, which is right now, at least in Europe, a sentiment which data should not flow because of privacy issues. Uh, we have to change that. Otherwise, the potentials for the new economy, uh, uh, the, the new businesses uh, will be limited. Thank you for that, Kurt. And thank you also, Terry, both for the conversation and, it's, and for the leadership you both have accomplished in the past and will continue in the future. Let's have another conversation in a few months, see if things are a little brighter outside by then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Terrific. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments and please subscribe to other episodes in the podcast app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.